you in here. Hi, I'm sure. Maria. That's David Perlmutter, Dr. David Perlmutter, my friend, and he's actually here with me, not where he normally is, which is on the other side of the country. So we decided to do this together. Even though we're socially distant right now. Oh yeah, we're socially distant. You came in with your mask. You're totally vaccinated. Right, totally Thank you vaccinated. For, yes. And I COVID tested yesterday, so we're all good. And I'm boosted. Me too. Oh, you're boosted too. Yeah, okay, so we're boosted. boosted. There's six immunizations between the two of us. That's good, yeah. And I'm all for like if I needed a seven. So don't mess eight. with us. Yeah, don't mess. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking yeah. about? <laughs> we're, we're talking about your new book. Ah. This is a book that's coming out in February, right? But we wanted to talk about it today because you were in town. Right. And because we just like to get together because we're so aligned on so many things. and. Dr. David Perlmutter is an expert on so many things, my grain brain in particular, uh, but we've worked uh, Your grain brain. Yeah, your grain <laughs> brain. It's his grain brain book, but it, I would talk about my own book, grain brain. But you're such a leader in the kind of Alzheimer's prevention space, and so we've talked a lot. Did you hear that? Alzheimer's prevention, that's something we don't always talk about, is it? We, we try to talk a lot yeah, about Yeah, I'm just it. saying, yeah. in general, people talk about treatment. We heard about a new treatment in February. Right. That really didn't turn out to be very much at all. We'll leave it at that. But the notion of prevention. Yeah, well, I've always been a big proponent sure. of uh, prevention. Sure, always have, that I've known. Yeah, and because I think that when we talk about prevention, that puts us in the driver's seat. And it's not um, that we're saying, if you do these five or six things, you definitely won't get Alzheimer's, you won't get dementia, but it does give you a fighting chance in it, right? And we talk, uh, you talk a lot about what we eat. I talk a lot about how we engage uh, socially, how we sleep, how we exercise, and it really is kind of adopting a brain healthy lifestyle. It's so true, and, and one of the things that Maria has talked about for so long is the fact that this is by and large a woman's issue, two yeah. to one. And, and that might represent, I'm sorry to say, why it gets somewhat neglected in our society. You think so? Well, I think women have not, you know, haven't been the subject of research. Right. Uh, drugs are developed with men, right. for men. Mm -hmm. And uh, Just think about that. I mean, I know we don't always have, we have uh, men and women in our audience, but I think this is something that I talk a lot about, and I'm so glad to hear you talk about it as well, that all of the drugs that we're all taking have been developed on men. Adult men. So Adult men. Repurposing drugs for women and for children as if children are little adults and women are just, you know, uh, men. Yeah, what are, what are women? I know. <laughs> but um, this is all we're about... We're powerhouses and we bet. need our own research. We need to be treated differently because our bodies and our brains age differently. And I always say that's not sexist, that's just smart. It's being smart about our health, it's being smart about prevention, and that's why we're very aligned when we talk about Alzheimer's prevention, when you talk about all the subjects you talk about, I'm so interested. And this is David's new book, uh, which is super interesting. It's, it's got a great title, it's called Drop Acid. Now what do you mean by that? Because when anybody talks about dropping acid, they don't think about what you're writing about. I don't know what they're thinking about if they're dropping oh, okay. acid, but uh, it's about something called uric acid. So right. uric acid, we now know, is a powerful player in the world of metabolism. What does that mean? It means it's really relevant as it relates to your blood sugar, mm -hmm. inflammation in your body, oxidative stress, insulin resistance, and guess what? Those are all factors that you've been talking about that yeah. people in the Alzheimer's prevention world have been talking about for an awful long time. When we see research that shows that people with higher levels of uric acid have a 55% increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, a 165% increased risk for vascular dementia, we need to pay attention. And the good news is that uric acid is something we can much more easily control than others of the metabolic things that you've known about, the blood sugar, for example, we can drive our uric acid levels down quite easily. Now you talk about in the beginning of the book, because even when you told me about this, I said, oh, I thought uric acid was only regarding gout. That's exactly right. And I, so I was like, what are you, are you writing a book about gout? This or? is not your grandfather's uric acid. Okay, so explain <laughs> that, because I think this is great for if you have a loved one who has gout, right? This is a really important, and gout, from what I understand, is incredibly painful yes. to experience. So, in medical school and even doctors today learned about uric acid in the context of gout, these 
painful crystals that appear in your toe or in your fingers. And it's so much more than that. Uh, yes, high levels of uric acid will bring you gout or could bring you gout. But now we look at uric acid through a, no, a brand new lens, this lens of metabolic issues, regulating our blood sugar, regulating how much body fat we produce and store, even regulating our blood pressure, all uh, influenced highly by uric acid. So this is, again, not the, the gout-related uric acid that we used to know about. It's so much more important than that. So you're talking about it in terms of controlling blood sugar and achieving, achieving extraordinary health. We're hearing so much lately, I think, about you know insulin levels, controlling blood sugar. So for people who might be type 2 diabetic or don't want to become type 2, and that increases as we age, correct? Right, the, the risk chance, does. The risk does. What's the best thing to do short of like cutting out all sugar, which I know is the optimal thing to do. But for those of us who have a little bit of a sweet tooth we, you've who all, struggle. You've always said that to me. I know. And I, I try to be as kind as I possibly okay, be can. Okay, be brutal, be brutal. <laughs> well, when Rhea says that uh, some of us have a sweet tooth, the reality is that every person walking the planet has a sweet tooth. Okay, got it. Why? Because it's a survival mechanism. It told mm. our ancestors that food is safe, that food is good for you, eat it. So we developed this desire for sweet, it allowed us to survive. Nowadays, it's obviously what we don't want. We don't want to be eating sweet foods 24-7, 365. In our hunter-gatherer times, yeah. and even before that, it said, eat this fruit because winter is coming. When does natural fruit in the wild ripen? It's the late summer, early fall. Tells your body, make fat, raise your blood sugar so you will survive the winter. Well, now that we're using that mechanism for which uric acid plays the leading role, we're using it every day of the year, telling our bodies make fat, raise blood sugar, raise blood pressure as a survival mechanism. It's what we call an evolutionary environmental mismatch. We don't need to be leveraging or giving into that the sense of needing sugar all the time. But so how do we, those of us who have a sweet tooth, and I'm glad to say that you say all of us do, we know it's bad for our cognitive health. Right. We know it's bad for our physical health, and I distinguish those two, right? Um, because I think what you're always talking about is not losing weight, you know, not being on a diet. You're talking about having a lifestyle, a health style, right? So what's the best way short of just cutting out all sugar, going cold turkey, and I know that's desired, right? But what is the best way we're in, you know, kind of moving into the holidays, which is a rough time of year, and then you've got this book coming out. What's the best kind of plan for somebody who wants to kind of begin to establish a healthy, holistic lifestyle? Well, uh, first I have to say in all candor and transparency that last night gingerbread men spoke to my wife and me. Aha, uh -huh. okay. And we yeah. gave in. You gave in. That's we good. So you're not perfect. You're not perfect. So don't, no. don't, don't, don't shame me for my sweet tooth. I never do. I let you, you take care of that for yourself <laughs> more right. than enough. That's true. But anyway, the gingerbread men spoke to us. Okay. But anyway, having said that, um, it's about free fructose in the form of drinks, even fruit juice, really high in fructose. Right. Fructose is metabolized into uric acid. That's the acid we want to drop. And that's telling your body, make fat, store fat, raise your blood sugar. So if we can reduce those inroads into the uric acid, we have a very powerful new tool for reining in our metabolic mayhem. So the, the reason that Maria is taking quercetin, maybe yeah, that's, that's where we exactly were. that's exactly where we were. Because quercetin dramatically lowers uric acid almost as well as a drug. Oh, well, that's so good, then that's what I'm taking. That's fantastic. So we're going to send you a monitor so you can check your own uric acid level right here. Oh. And then you can post it, and then we can see where it is. And yeah, if it's can too high, can everybody check their own uric go acid? Go online to Amazon and buy a uric acid monitor. Or most people mm -hmm. have already had it checked. What's part of your annual blood work? Actually, I have annual blood work all the time, and I never see my uric acid checked. Mm, I bet it's there. You bet it's there. Yeah. Under uric acid? Under uric acid. I just looked at my blood panel because I just actually did it yesterday, and I uh -huh. didn't see really? it. Really? Okay. So I have an appointment. I have a video with my doctor this afternoon. I'm going to ask about that because those are one of the numbers that you're saying we should know. Yes, but here's what's really important. Okay. And that is that if you talk to your doctor about uric acid, she or he may say, uh, it's, it's fine, it has nothing to do with anything else except for gout. And you know, with all due respect, people tend to be down on what they're not up on. 
Meaning, I love that. Don't be down on what you're not <laughs> up on. I love that. That's a great line. So I'm going to say to my doctor, excuse me, you may not be down for what I'm actually up on, but what I'm up on is that I should know my uric acid level. Right. And what should they be? Under 5.5. Under 5.5. What should my A1C numbers be? Mm -hmm. I would say 5.2-ish or lower. 5.2-ish. Or lower, yeah. Or lower, and yeah. the best way to lower them is... Is it A1C? I, yeah. Cut the fructose. Cut the fructose. So I don't drink any um, fruit juice at all. Good, because? I just don't like it, and because I think it's really high in sugar. It is. But exactly I don't have right. a 5.2. Okay. So Are you going to let us... Uh, it's it, higher than 5.2. It's higher than 5. Okay. It's in the 5.5. Five. Okay, it's like good. Five, five, you know, but it, I'm constantly monitoring it, and I... You know, I think many people are constantly monitoring, trying to figure out what raises it. And I know probably chips raise it or carbohydrates raise it. That's true. Right. Uh, but I, I would say that for all of you watching right now, uh, the normal range isn't good enough. When your doctor says your mm -hmm. A1C is in the normal range, uric acid, blood sugar in the normal range, that's for other people. That's not for us moving forward. We want optimal range. Okay, so optimal range for uric acid. 5.5 or lower. Now your doctor 5. might say... 5.5 or lower. So milligrams get up on what deciliter. your doctor may not know. Right. Doctor may say, hey, it's under 7. That's good. 7 is only a, a value that relates to gout. And we're past it. If any of you want to bring information to your doctor or any healthcare providers yeah. watching right now, I would say Google two words. Uric, U-R-I-C, and the word metabolic. You don't want to Google uric and the word metabolism because then you'll get the metabolism of uric acid which is you don't need to know that uric and meta and metabolic and you'll see how profoundly related uric acid is to diabetes risk obesity risk hypertension risk dyslipidemia mm -hmm. means problems with your hdl and ldl these are all factors that relate to alzheimer's risk heart disease risk diabetes risk it's all about reining in our metabolic mayhem so kind of for people listening, because this book does not come out till February, I know you can pre-order it on Amazon now, right? And the book again called Drop Acid. This is really, I can see uh, asking me what the name of the book is. The Surprising New Science of Uric Acid, The Key to Losing Weight, Controlling Blood Sugar, and Achieving Extraordinary Health. Um, I think the last line being the optimal line that we all want to achieve extraordinary health. We all want to prevent neurodegenerative diseases. So before you can get this book into your hands, and I have a, a paperback so I didn't get anything special treatment, but what can people do now, really? Uh, well, maybe? she did get special treatment. I, I can't leave that one alone. Okay, She gets right. special treatment. She get, Yes, yeah, because he <laughs> came here, so that's get special treatment, but I didn't get the actual signed book or hard copy hard copy uh, book but and I don't even have this I have a I have a fake oh, with the real cover this? oh no okay. she does not right. well I, I have, have one it. now right I did get one I think yeah. you sent it to me but anyway so what can people start doing right now today they hear this they're concerned about inflammation they want to be in optimal health they want to tell their doctors what to get up on because their doctors may be down I love that so what do they what do they do starting now um, I think the first step is to find out what your uric acid level is. Okay, number one. And you, your yeah. doctor can, uh, most people, Maria perhaps not, but most people have had their uric acid already checked. It's on your blood work, it means a phone call. If your blood work was done recently, yes. they could probably run it on the blood that they have. Okay. They keep that for a so number of days. So get that to 5.5. 5.5. We'll tell you how in just a moment. but. You can get a uric acid monitor okay. online, on Amazon or wherever, uh, and measure it at home. I use a device called U-A-S-U-R-E, U -A -S -U -R -E, and it's a finger stick like a blood draw, yeah. a little tiny stick in under my thumbnail is what I like to do. And immediately it'll test your uric acid and you know what it is. But then what do you do? Then you implement what's called the love diet. Right, so I was going to say L-U-V. So what is the love diet? Lower uric values, it means avoiding those foods that can raise uric acid like fructose uh, foods that are high in purines those are certain foods like organ meats do your best to cut back on those and dare i say alcohol except for wine in women alcohol can raise uric acid levels as well So, is that really a keto lifestyle not really not and really. that's okay. the beauty of the love diet is it can work with keto it can work with paleo it can work with vegan kosher whatever the dietary preference is can all be seen through the lens of how to lower your uric acid. So you're on the love lifestyle plan? Well, my uric acid is 4.5, so I'm in good shape. 
And I and I, I avoid those foods. So I what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner? So generally, breakfast is around 12 or 1 p.m. I mean, so then that means he's intermittent fasting. Exactly. Right. And we have a chapter in the book on intermittent fasting. So and, breakfast is at noon. Well, yeah. And people say, well, that's lunch. Well, no. Breakfast is when you break fast. So I break fast at around 12 or 1. So you don't have coffee in the morning? I do have coffee. That's the okay. only thing that I will have. Sometimes I forget to eat and I get busy and I will have dinner and that's it. So then, I, then dinner and breakfast would be the same meal. What would that be? Not brow lunch, chef. But so you're only eating one meal a day? On occasion, that's what I do. Okay, but for those of us who are not totally. into one meal a day, that's going to be abrupt. But no, I understand. And, and so, we walk coffee. through. Coffee? Okay, so coffee. Give us an example of lunch uh, or breakfast. Breakfast would be it. generally some sort of vegetable, avocado, salad, or eggs and or eggs. That's typical. Um, I'm not real big into smoothies or shakes and things like that. I like to eat food. Uh, so you eat, so kind of, let's just kind of go over that. He's practicing intermittent fasting, but he's allowing himself coffee or maybe yeah. matcha or tea in the morning. Then he's breaking his fast at like noon. He's eating real food uh, with uh, fat. So you're talking lots about eggs. You're talking about avocado. Then what are you doing again? And lots of uh, extra virgin organic olive oil. We, in okay. fact, travel with it. It goes to wherever we go. So extra virgin olive oil, he travels with it. We don't have to all travel with it, but we can get it. And then you're talking about that at your brunch, lunch, breakfast, right. meal. And then what are you eating again at dinner? And then at dinner is the larger meal. And that's usually not too late so that we can have a long period of time after dinner until we break fast the next day. Mm -hmm. So again, you're talking about what's called intermittent fasting, and right. that is compressing the time of day that you eat right. to a shorter number of hours, so you're eight doing it to six 10 days. hours. So you're eating in between noon and eight o'clock. That's right. And that has been proven to increase longevity. We're now learning a lot about the importance of that kind of caloric restriction to certain hours, correct? Yes, and, and more importantly for our discussion, right. it's uh, the work of Dr. Sachin Panda has revealed that this is a powerful tool mm -hmm. to improve your metabolism, your blood sugar. You know how focused you are. Yeah. If you're a type 2 diabetic, you have quadrupled your risk for Alzheimer's. Quadrupled as much as. Quadrupled. So we don't want to become type 2 diabetic. So what is the difference though between what you've just advocated as a kind of lunch brunch thing to dinner where you're eating some protein, you're eating greens again, you're probably eating fat. What's the difference between that and a keto diet? Because so many people come up to me and say, I'm so confused with all of this, these dietary um, plans. Like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be eating keto. Am I supposed to be eating vegan? Am I supposed to be eating Mediterranean? Uh, well, what I described, the, the intermittent part of that right. story. So if you have about 14 to 16 hours of not eating, you're going to start making ketones in your body. So you're already making those ketones. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a full-on keto diet because there is some carbohydrate. Right. There's carbohydrate in the form of the fiber in the vegetables right. and, and other carbs that enter the meal. But there's no free sugar, that's for sure. So it's not full-on uh, aggressive keto. Right, because I've also heard uh, from mutual friends of ours and others that women need more carbohydrates than is advocated for in the typical keto diet. As your friend Sarah Gottfried has right. said, mm -hmm. uh, that it's harder for women to get into ketosis, first of all, and uh, secondly, to the benefits that they derive from ketogenic diet may not be as profound as you would find in men. So l let's talk a little bit about, and so that you're saying if you follow that kind of lifestyle as opposed to diet, because I don't like talking about diet because women are obsessed about diets from starting like myself age eight or something on, but in terms of a lifestyle, that will drop your uric acid. That's right. And so the, the point is, how aggressive do you need to be? Right. And you have to be as aggressive as it takes to get your uric acid level normalized which is not that difficult, but you don't know until you start checking. So you're also, now how important is this, because you've also talked a lot about being gluten-free. You've right. talked about the power of the grain or eliminating that. So how, how many things should we be focused on? Should we be gluten-free? Should we be on the love <laughs> diet? Should we be checking our uric acid, checking our A1Cs, all of these things? So of everything you mentioned, I think probably the least valuable is A1C, believe it or not. Wow, really? For a number of reasons. Uh, it's highly variable between people, depending mm -hmm. even on their blood count, number one. Uh, and number two, it's a test that is a 90-day running average. 
we would like to know what your blood sugar is every 10 minutes. So that means continuous glucose monitor, where you would know that in an ideal world, which has become very popular, right. people know what their blood sugar is just by looking at their smartphone. And what should that be throughout the day? Well, it's going to vary. Your blood sugar is going to come up after a meal, as right. it should. So you're really not looking at what it is right now, but what is the trend, what is the average, what is what we call the area under the curve. But blood sugars in the upper 80s to low 90s is really the ideal optimal range, as opposed to when your doctor says, well, 105, 110, you're not diabetic yet. So we don't want to be there. We don't even want to tempt the diabetes fates. And so I think what, what kind of in summary Dr. Pomutter is really focusing my mind on here is not being normal, being optimal. You bet. And that's a really important word for us all to take away, that just because our doctor says this is normal or that's normal, we don't want to be quote unquote normal. We want to be optimal. We want to prevent. We want to be focusing on personalized health care. Right? We want to be extraordinary. We want to be extraordinary. Look, we want to be extraordinary. There we go. Who doesn't want to be extraordinary? So I think that what I've always liked about what you've advocated for is kind of taking control of your health, right? Putting yourself in the driver's seat, being educated, being informed. Totally, being your own advocate. And uh, that's not the focus of modern medicine. Again, the focus of modern medicine is wait till you get sick and we'll have a pill for you. And We don't want that. No, that's not what... Uh, being your own health advocate is all about. You can chart your health destiny. You just have to have the tools. This becomes a powerful new tool, and you're going to hear a lot more about it. And by the way, the falling cherry, eating cherries, especially for women, helps drop uric acid. That's why there's a cherry <laughs> in the cover. So uh, we'll we'll continue. We'll talk about this again in February. The book is called Drop Acid by Dr. David Perlmutter. Uh, who uh, has been a big advocate uh, for our health in the health space for many, many decades. This comes out in February, but you can pre-order it. And hopefully we'll all begin to start knowing our uric acid numbers. We will all start becoming uh, extraordinary when it comes to our health. So thank there you, you so thank much you. for Good seeing you. you. Good to see you. And remember, your health is in your power. Don't forget that. Thank you so much.